All right, we're going to kick off this interview again with a shout out to someone who dropped a review on Apple Podcasts. This one is from Viku Shavas. He said, David's work in the community building space has been exciting to follow. It's full of specific observations, quality advice, and is always very thorough. This podcast is not an exception. Thank you so much. Really appreciate the reviews. They're a huge help in getting this podcast out to more people. So please, if you haven't already, hit pause, take a moment, and just drop a quick review on Apple Podcasts. On to today's interview. I have a really, really awesome guest for you all today, Uh, someone who I've been following since the earliest days of my career as an entrepreneur and a community builder. His name's Andrew Warner. He's the founder of Mixergy, a podcast and show that he's been running for over 14 years. And I've been following the show and following his work for well over a decade now. He's basically where I learned entrepreneurship from in the early days through his interviews and all the incredible guests that he's had on the show. And he just published his new book, Stop Asking Questions, which shares all of these really incredible insights and secrets that he's learned from his many, many years of interviewing all these incredible CEOs and guests. And this is just such a fun interview because one, it's super meta to interview someone about interviewing, right, on a podcast, about podcasts. And he just has so many really interesting insights on how to get people to open up and be more vulnerable, how to get people to share deeper and deeper insights, how to ask really personal questions, but in a way that doesn't offend people. And maybe you have a podcast, but this applies to everything in community building or creating content. It's all about getting people to open up, asking more specific questions, asking people to share their wisdom and insights with each other. So you can take everything from this interview and apply it to your podcast, your articles and research you're doing, to your community spaces, anything where it involves conversation and creating content with other people. It's just a goldmine of very substantial, practical advice in this one. You're going to want to take a lot of notes. Hope you enjoy it. Let's dive in. Andrew? Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. I feel like we have to start by sharing the story of your yours and my first interaction, which I don't think you would have remembered at the time, but I've reminded you of it a few times since then, where where I, being a huge fan of you and your show at Mixergy, uh, had the opportunity to jump on randomly, right? So so you you were doing your show, you had a no show at, at Mixergy and um, I was a little know nothing, brand new out of college, professional, like hungry entrepreneur that never would have been on your show. And you're like, hey, who's an audience that wants to come on because our guests didn't show up? And I just, without even thinking, was like, oh, I'll do it. <laughs> and I got on and had nothing to say or contribute. I think I <laughs> said something stupid about like golf or something. I'm not, I don't even play golf. I was just so nervous. <laughs> and, and you're like, all right, who else wants to come on? And we just, <laughs> just like moved on within five minutes. I do try to be uh, uh, open about stuff like that. I do remember it. And then I remember when you reminded me the first time when we connected the online person with the with the offline person, you know, mm-hmm. we'd started running into each other at events. We have friends in common now. And so um, it was good to reconnect with that. It's also good to realize how helpful it was for me at the time to have done live interviews, to stream them, to be one of the first people to stream. And I think I didn't value it at the time because the audience was pretty small. It was like a mm-hmm. hundred. And I thought if it's less than a thousand or less than infinite, then it must be a failure. But in reality, there was some good engagement there, good interaction. You and I met. And like you said, you weren't the type of entrepreneur I was interviewing then, but you were the type of entrepreneur I eventually would interview and did interview on Mixergy. And so it was a good way to connect with people. And I think that at the time I got so hung up on numbers that I did not appreciate that. And The one thing that I think I'm really grateful to have not looked at numbers on is the download numbers because they were so awful in the beginning of podcasting. Mm. And I'm glad that I didn't because I think I would have constantly felt bad about podcasting not matching whatever imagined vision I had for how big it should be. So what I'm saying is community was great. Looking at numbers was awful for Mm. me. That is interesting. The the live numbers were about 100, were were the podcast or the recording listeners also low at that time? Like I said, no, no, they were higher than that. But like I said, I'm glad I didn't look. I used to, in the very beginning of Mixergy, 
look at the download numbers and the website hits just religiously. Mm. And when it was under 100, I just felt so down, so pissed, so much like a failure and a loser for focusing on that. Because before that, I had a business where the email list was 20 million unique, 30 million base permission email. That means that some people were on multiple lists. And to go to 100 or less than 100 felt mm. like such a come down and I couldn't deal with it well. And I remember that when I talked to um, Seth Godin at the time, even though everyone else had comments on their blog and that was the important thing about blogging, that it was going to allow the reader to respond, he said, I'm not going to have any comments. And when I asked him, he said, I write to people's needs and what they want and what they'll get excited about when I have comments. And he said he decided not to. And I said, you know what? You're going to sacrifice an an integral part of blogging because it doesn't make you better at blogging. I'm going to sacrifice an integral part of every business, which is looking at the numbers of this podcast because it doesn't make me better. It makes me feel worse. And I'm really glad that I didn't. I, I find that for some things, looking at numbers makes me makes me worse. Hmm. Hmm. That is a good reminder, especially as I am constantly looking at the numbers for this podcast. You know, this podcast is only about a year and a half old, and I did, I'm i doing it during kind of the, the, the podcast renaissance that seems to be happening now. You've been doing podcasting since before it was cool, and then it got cool, and then it went to not cool again, and then it got cool again. So you've yeah. gone through the many waves of, of podcasting over the years, um, and I'm I'm honored to have you on because it, it, it's also fun to think back to that and just think about like how I felt at that time, how I perceived myself, how I perceived you. And so it's like a little bit of a dream come true to, to you know, over that. That was 13 years ago. That was 2009. Wow. So so that that no, it's 12 years ago. So to see like how far things have changed, how both how both of us have grown in the last 12 years and to be able to have you on the podcast it's pretty cool. I'm really excited about the idea that so many people are creating podcasts. Sometimes it, it people want me to be more bummed out about it because, mm -hmm. hey, this thing that was special and unique to you is now being done by everyone. But from a business point of view, that's true. But I, I never saw myself as like a podcaster for life. It was more like I really enjoy these conversations. Why aren't more people realizing it? Hmm. Why aren't more people realizing that they could have access to the people whose books they read and they can actually ask them the hard questions that are in their heads and then get a response and say, how do I apply the stuff that works and get a response? And I just felt like you're, people are undervaluing it and I think they're overthinking how hard it could be. And I'm glad to see more and more people do that. I, I agree. And, and that's the thing. I do look at the numbers with the podcast, but the thing that keeps me going and doing it even when numbers aren't always great is that genuine enjoyment of the conversation and being able to have a space that I can have people like you on to to have these discussions and ask questions. I, I learn a ton. And whenever I get curious about a topic, it's very easy for me yeah. to go, okay, who are three people that I, I really respect in this yeah. topic? Let's see if we get them on the show. Um, so I love that. And you know what, David? I'm sorry to dis yeah. distract from what you were about to ask, but I feel like one <laughs> of the problems- This feels like your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do interrupt a lot. But I, I, I think what you said is important, and it's something I've been wrestling with, which is, what is the thing that I'm super interested in that I want to bring people on the podcast to ask about? And I, I feel like that's the thing that was great in the beginning. I started the podcast because- I'd failed with this one software company and I didn't want to fail again and I want to learn from the best. And people can watch me and my hunger to understand for myself and listen and learn along the way. But the fact that it was just such a personal need that I understood it so deeply that I could be so vulnerable about it, I think made it more compelling and made the answers more useful. I'm trying to think of like, what's the thing that I'm dying to know the answer to now that I could lay it on the line and say, this is what it is. The closest I have is that I'm now taking a point in my life to just say, I want to disconnect a bit. I want mm. to just find something else to do that brings up a different aspect of my life. Kind of like a few years ago, I decided that I would, you know, after the first company that I started, I decided I'm just going to learn to exercise, to run, to bike. I'm going to learn to date when I was just such a hermit before that. I'm looking for the next thing and I don't know what it is. And the closest I've come in, in an interview like this, actually, this is what helps me think too, Yeah, to be interviewed. 
I thought maybe what I should do is ask the interviewees that I talk to, these amazing people, about their quirky interests and see if there's another quirky interest I could take up. Because I've seen people who are entrepreneurs who this one guy interviewed, he, he, he was on dog slides. Like who does that? I don't know if that's for me, but I like that that's a weird thing and that he that he had these life-changing experiences through that realization. I like that some people are on some whacked out drugs that I don't even know, and they're having these interesting realizations on that. I wanna be open to stuff like that and see what else is there. So that's the closest thing, but I, I agree with you completely. I think that podcasting and conversations in general are so much more interesting when the person who is in the conversation has a deep need and curiosity for something. That's when it goes somewhere meaningful. The rest is... Eh, trying to entertain an audience that really has so many other alternatives that it's it just comes across as a weak weak alternative. A hundred percent. That that's my main gauge for who I invite on the podcast. Like, is this somebody that I'm genuinely interested in asking questions and learning from? And I I just want to draw a parallel there to community as everyone listening is is building community because it's the same exact thing for community. When, when people ask like, what do you look for in a community manager? How do you know you should start a community? It's always comes back to genuine curiosity for me. If you are genuinely curious about the topic, then start a podcast, start a community around it because you're gonna show up very authentically. You're gonna feel motivated to show up and have these conversations. But if you're starting it just to build an audience or for a business that you know, but you don't have a personal genuine curiosity for, it's gonna feel like work to show up and have the conversations and build the community every day. Yeah. Probably apply to everything in business, maybe everything in yeah. life. Yeah. Well, I, I wanna, <laughs> usually we start off with providing the little, little context and story. We, we dove right into it, but I just wanna make sure people have the context on your background. Could you give kind of the two minute story on, on how you started Mixergy and how you came to write your new book, Stop Asking Questions, which we're gonna dive into as well. As I alluded to, I had this first company that did well. It was an email newsletter company. Then, and that's the one that had 20 million unique email addresses, and we did greeting cards and a few other things, and it did really well. I took a bunch of time off to cycle, to run, to date, to explore other parts of my life. And then I started an invitation company that bombed. And because it bombed, and I hated that it bombed, I said, I'm going to start interviewing people to learn how to be better and more successful. And the thing that, I, that, that I've always done in my life is, I've systemized stuff, I've documented stuff, I create these processes for things. And for conversations, as anal as I am, I did the same thing. And so if I found over time that there was an interview that I did with an entrepreneur and there's a question that led them to be more open, I'd go back and look at the transcript, see what that question was, I'd name it, and then I'd put it in a Google Doc with a section of the interview that shows how it worked. And pretty soon I had this collection of techniques. People think that I get guests to open up because I'm just a good conversationalist. I think that I am a good conversationalist because I'm very systemized, because there's these levers that I know I can, I can, uh, I can pull. And that gets a conversation to be more open. Mm. Well, let's dive into that. Um, what are the levers? The biggest one that made me really appreciate the systemization was I for years was bummed that when I interviewed Jason Freed one time and I asked him about any failures or setbacks, he said, no. And I said, come on, everyone does. And he said, no. I said, well, I'm just, everyone has some kind of problem. Everyone has some kind of failure. And he said, Andrew, I don't think it's helpful. I said, come on, it is. And he said, well, I think some people just don't have that. Sometimes things just work out. And because I'm a runner, I I have no way to escape my thoughts, no way to escape the thing that didn't work out. And so while I was running for years, I would go, oh, I hated how that worked out. I eventually realized that I really like inside the actor studio because they could get actors to open up. And so I hired the producer from there and I told him my problem and he said, oh, join the resistance. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, I have a therapist and the therapist would have men sit in her office and when she'd say, okay, tell me about your problem, they'd say, I don't have any problems. I'd go, come on, the reason you're in here is you have a problem. I don't have any problems. She has a problem, my wife has a problem. Go, well, if she has a problem, don't you think you do? Not, not me. I'd go, okay. So eventually she said, instead of arguing with them, she'd say, oh, I'm so glad. Instead of fighting their resistance, she joined the resistance. She said, I'm so glad to see that somebody has no problems. It has it easy. Everyone else has problems. It's interesting to see that you have it so easy. And the, the man would go, 
Easy? Are you kidding me? Do you understand how much of a fight we had just this morning? Because I'm, ha- and now we're on, on a roll. And so he told me join the resistance. I love that he named it so succinctly. I wrote join the resistance in a Google Doc, and then I tried it a bunch of times, including one time that I tried it with Jason Freed, the founder of Basecamp. When you ask him how how much revenue he has, he goes, I, I don't think about revenue. We we have. We only think about profits, and it's in the tens of millions. You know, like he'll tell you things are going well, and rightfully so. He's earned the right to to be proud of the business he created. And in one of the interviews, I I asked him, "Tell me about a problem that you have." And he said, "Well, no, things are fine." I go, "Ah, it's interesting to see that everything worked out in this business. That this is just such an easy business." <laughs> and he goes, "Not e- easy. We had this chat app called uh, Campfire, and the thing just didn't succeed." And and now I got insight into why his business works even when things don't succeed because he created this app and he didn't throw all his money into it and there was no need to make it go big or go home. He just tried it, didn't work, closed it up, and then whatever he learned from it, he integrated into Basecamp, his successful project management company that's doing tens of millions in profit, right? So joined the resistance, went into my Google Doc, a copy of the section of the interview where I used it with him, went underneath it, and before long, I had a collection of these techniques and I found myself using it with cab drivers who were giving me rides, with friends at dinner, with other interviewees, and if you have something that's named and documented and you think about it and you study it, eventually you start to use it so much that it becomes second nature and then you start to share it with other people, which I did first with my producers, than with other interviewers and before long bah, I said this could be a book and that's what ask uh, or stop asking questions is I love it and I love that example do you, do you think that the there's an element of wording there where if you ask somebody if they have a problem it makes it about them or something that makes them feel lesser than like if I have a problem it's about me it's some sort of observation about myself Whereas if you ask them, you know, kind of the rephrasing of, oh, it sounds like everything is easy then, it reframed it to say like, you don't have uh, a challenge, (laughs) right? Like asking someone what their biggest challenges are feels very different than asking them what their biggest problem is. And so maybe that wording creates an opportunity for I don't them to know. open up I have more. a really good friend. You and I both have, you know what I'm going to name names? Shane Mack. If you ask him about any of his problems, Shane will genuinely say, eh, people make things too hard. Life is easy. People overcomplicate it, right? Mm. Uh, he had a company that he raised money for. He sold it. Didn't work out great. But so what? He ended up with a great job from it, from the company that acquired. Made good money. Starting a new company in, in crypto. Um, what about side projects? Well, a side project of his ended up doing phenomenally well in the virtual, right? So he's a really nice guy and very genuine. But you say, what are your challenges? And he just deflects it. A yeah. lot of people are like that. Mm. Now, the thing is that some people are open, some people are not. The The thing that I was trying to do was come up with a few tools, you know? Like, right. if you try to unscrew a screw and it doesn't work out, you say, you know what? Maybe I'm using a Phillips head screwdriver and I need to use a mm. flat head. Maybe I need to actually go get pliers because the thing just is too stuck. You know, whatever it is, you want a set of tools. And in conversations... We tend to not have a set of tools because most people don't have a place to experiment, to have a place to do what I did, which is talk to a bunch of people, have all those conversations transcribed, study them like a maniac, bring in other people, and then and then name and test and name and test and all and all that. And I was lucky that I got that. So you know what- who else has that? Salespeople do that. If you see the best salespeople, they study their material. A friend of mine is now working for a company called Gong. That's an automated system for testing salesmanship to see what's working and converting sales. I think most people don't have that. And so I was lucky that I had it and I said, I'm going to share it with the world. What, what do you think it is about reframing the question into, oh, it seems like everything's been really easy then? What is it about that that? unlocks people, it makes people want to share their actual challenges. or Because the person who's putting up a resistance to telling you about their challenge, they feel proud of how easy, they, they feel proud of something and you want to like come at it in a different way to go around their pride instead of arguing with them and then having them keep putting up more and more pride. You want to come around it. Another way to come around it is this. I could have also with Jason Fried or anyone else said, The reason I'm asking is I'm going through my own set of setbacks Mm. and I'm looking to see 
if if you had a setback, how did you learn from it? I'm trying to understand that, right? And so that's another thing that I've written about in the book. If you tell people your reason for what you're doing, often they'll respond well. And I always say, mm. I always say, often, right? If one tool doesn't work, try another. If I if I try join the resistance and that doesn't work, I explain my my purpose. If I try something else and doesn't work, I try a different tool. And frankly, if they all don't work, human beings are not like computers. They're just not going to give you every output that you want based on your input. And it's just something I've had to accept, which is it's okay. Just move on. Yeah, I, I, I love that. It, it definitely taps into empathy then because you're making it about you and your challenges, not them. So, and then they might start to share examples of like, oh, well, I, yeah, I've been through that before. It becomes, it's almost aligning with their pride, right? Because the yes. challenges become something to be proud of, of like, yeah, I'm successful, even though I've had these challenges rather than I'm successful, but I have these challenges. You're also bringing people in on a on a goal. It's it's important to tell people what your mission is. So after I sold that greeting card company that I started, I I said, let me see how other people do their sales meetings because my sales meetings sucked. I never I was never employed anywhere where there were sales meetings. So I didn't know how to do it. And so I went to uh, this one session of Mary Kay Cosmetics. I actually became a Mary Kay Cosmetics girl. I signed up, had the box. I just want to learn. <laughs> yeah. Um, and what I did was. I watched and I saw that the person who led it would tell people, tell your clients, tell your friends that you are aiming for whatever level goal that you have so that if they could help you get there, then it would be, you know, that that, you're, that the higher purpose is or that the, the, sorry, what I'm trying to say is you want to tell the person that you're selling to what your goal is and have them be on board. And people are on board, even if the, the goal is, I just want to earn the next prize in the Mary Kay collection of prizes by selling more. Would you help me by listening to this? Even if it's, I'm practicing my sales pitch, would you help me? I'm trying to grow my sales because I want to reach this level in sales. Will you throw a party mm. for me, right? So that you can introduce my my makeup to your friends. That's really powerful. And I, I didn't realize it until I started doing interviews. And I think that I have to keep reminding myself to tell people that higher purpose. I love that. Tell them your goal then they feel aligned, the mm -hmm. advice, the feedback, their answer feels like it's helping you achieve your goal. And, and people like to feel like they're helping. It's similar to saying like, oh yeah, I've had these challenges. You know, I could use your help. Now they'll open up more because it's not just them talking about themselves. It's it's feeling like they're helping you. Um, and I love this topic because it's so relevant for every community builder. I feel like Oftentimes, the success of our community and the success of our work building community is very dependent on our ability to get people to open up and share and be honest and be vulnerable mm -hmm. or share like inside secrets or inside knowledge. Um, so we, we shared a few here. One is um, join the resistance. So kind of align with them or, or figure out like, okay, oh, it's been very easy for you and give them that space to be like, well, it hasn't been easy. There's the uh, sharing that, well, I've had this problem. Can you help me? Yeah, give them a higher purpose. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, the third one is higher purpose, you know, or sharing your goal up front of, I'm trying to achieve this thing or I'm trying to figure this out. That's why I'm asking this question. Um, love those. Are there any others on that topic of essentially like helping people open up or, or share knowledge more openly that's worked? Any other tools? Yeah, I think it's really helpful to look for what I call a shoved fact. The example that I give is we had Thanksgiving dinner a few years ago at my house. We were all sitting in my living room waiting for one guest to show up. He finally comes in late and he says, I'm sorry I'm late. You know, when you when you get a divorce, everything is got to be in two different houses. And I didn't know where my daughter's sweater was. Plus, there's traffic on the way over here. <laughs> yeah. Immediately, a family member said, oh, yeah. Traffic is really tough here because there's so many Silicon Valley people, move, so many people moving into Silicon Valley. Another person said something else and a third person said, ah, you can forget about it. Come sit at the table. You're here now. We can put that behind us. That was a shove fact. He didn't have to say about the double houses. The traffic would have been enough, but yeah. he shoved it in because he was dying to talk about it. None of us, me included, brought it up and asked him about the thing that he shoved in that he was dying to talk about. And we see that a lot in conversation, mm. that people will say something that's a little bit irrelevant, but it's personal and they didn't have to. And they're doing it because they're dying to talk about him. Mm. In business, I've often ignored it thinking, oh, that's personal. It's not for me to bring up or it's not for me to talk about. 
And what I found is if somebody's bringing it up, they want you to talk about it. It's part of life. If we see people like robots, we're going to have a really bad experience with them because people are pretty junky robots. We're not that good. But if we see people as these emotional creatures that have egos and have needs and have bruises and have successes and they want to talk, even though logically it makes no sense to talk to clear things out, right? But if we understand that that's still true and we live with that truth, then we have better conversations. We have better connections with people. And so I look for shove facts a lot and I bring them up and I talk about them. I love that. Yeah, it's so true. And people just sneak it in there. It's almost like a subtext. It's it's really brief. But if you could pick up on those things, there's probably such a huge opportunity to open up a really meaningful conversation. It drives me to another question that I had for you, which is like in in doing really great interviews, to what extent do you feel like it's important to follow the lead of the guest? So if the guest has a shoved fact or something that comes up that was com- is completely off track from what you envisioned for the interview and like what you wanted to teach and learn from it for, for your audience, to what extent do you like follow their lead versus say like, all right, well, let's bring it back to the focus of the interview. You know, I was talking to my sister last night and she knew that I grew up like two different people. The guy before Dale Carnegie had to win friends and influence people before I read the book and the guy afterwards. The guy before didn't know how to have conversations, didn't have friends, whatever. The guy afterwards was much better at relating to people, to strangers and so on. What she didn't know was that after I read the book, I went and I knocked on the offices of Dale Carnegie and Associates. It happened to be in Manhattan. I grew up in Queens. I just went o- went over and I said, can I work here because I want to learn more about how you do it. I want to see it in action and I'll work here for free. I was in college, maybe 20 or so years old. And they said, yeah. And I got to see it and I got to experience it and I got really good at it. And one of the things that Dale Carnegie says is that the way to be interesting is to be interested. And mm-hmm. the whole idea of Dale Carnegie is that people have these passions. He gives example of somebody who has a stamp collection and the, the salesperson takes an interest in the stamp collection, brings more stamps for the person to share with so the, the client can share with his kid and as a result has a better relationship and closes sales. I don't remember the details of it, but that's the thrust of all of his book. Take interest, express interest in others. And I was so good at it that I remember one time I was on the train with this guy, Michael. Um, in this case, I won't give his last name because the guy was freaking boring me to tears. And I wrote about it in the book because he kept talking about freaking comic books. Now, God bless people who love comic books. I got one right here. I've been reading this comic novel with my kids. I have no, no put down of it, but it's not for me really. And I definitely don't have enough conversation about comic books, but we were talking about it. I see that he got lit up. So I kept asking him and he got more lit up. And so I kept asking him and I kept sitting there and I go, I hate this. I hate that I'm on the F train like this. This is the worst. And I said, if this is what Dale Carnegie is about, which is basically sacrificing myself for other people and so they like me more, and then if they like me more, then I don't know what. I, I'm not into that. And I had this this questioning of the whole Dale Carnegie process. And eventually what I realized was there is a Venn diagram there of what people are super passionate about and what I am curious and have patience for. And I don't have to go outside of my comfort zone just for them. I don't care if the person really is into comic books. Now, if this guy Michael was dying and I'm on like in the seat next to him at the hospital and he wants to go off on comic books, <laughs> good luck to you. Great, I'm sitting for you, right? If you're sad about your divorce and that's what you want to talk about, even if I don't care about your wife being the best or the worst, I'll listen to it because we're friends. But aside from those special cases, I get to decide what I'm interested in and I don't have to put up with it. And so truthfully, if you have some good techniques, you can say I'm out of here to, con- to parts of conversation that you don't care about or you can just leave those shove facts and not pick them up. So the answer to your question is, we have to respect ourselves and respect our interests and say, we're not gonna pick up on everything that the other person wants to talk about. But if there's an alignment there and we're really curious, oh, don't give up on that opportunity. I was really curious about what was going on with his divorce. I wanted to know about him, he's a family member. I was really curious about what's going on with divorces in general, because I'm a married person, right? You know, what's, what's there? You sold your company. I was curious what happened after you sell your company. I'm an entrepreneur. You want to know what the deal is, right? And so I missed it. And what I'm trying to do in this book is say, don't miss those opportunities. And I'm also trying to say, you have permission to bring it up. And if you feel awkward about it, I also give you techniques in the book for how to how to bring it up because it is awkward. And I'm not going to pretend that it's just easy to talk. Sorry, bring, bring what up? Is you like the personal questions? Yeah. Let's say you, you're hearing somebody shove a fact about how they just got divorced. 
mm-hmm. and you want to bring it up because you're wondering what's happening to them because you care about them because you also care about relationships and what happens at the end, right? But you're nervous. Can you just now pry into their life? Mm-hmm. One thing that I do is I use a double-barreled question. I learn that if you ask people two questions, they will pick the easiest of the two, mm. and if there's a hard one, they'll avoid it, right? So if you ask a politician, um, did, <laughs> uh, did you actually steal money, and what do you think about Groundhog Day today? Will, yeah. the, will the Groundhog see a shadow? He'll say, yeah, there's a lot going on, and I really do hope the Groundhog sees a shadow or whatever, right? right? And then maybe make a joke about it and go, okay, you, sir, and ask for the next question, right? They'll always pick the easiest, and everybody does that. And so what I do is if I want to ask a tough question, I use a double barrel question. There's two questions in one. I might say, if I could go back to that Thanksgiving, I might say something like, do you feel comfortable talking at dinner about what's going on with a divorce, Right. There are two questions there. Do you feel comfortable talking about this? And number two, would What's you feel? Would you tell me about your divorce? Uh, right. If he's uncomfortable, he'd say, oh, not right now, not at dinner. I'm not comfortable. Now, this seems like the type of thing that people would never do, right? You've just put them on the spot. They'll, ask, they'll have to ask, answer about the divorce or they'll have to answer about the thing. But I know because I've now done over 2,000 interviews and I have transcripts of this that I can see that when I ask a double-barreled question and the person does not want to answer it, they say, no, I don't want to answer it. And one example of that is the founder of Zendesk. He brought up the fact that in business, you sometimes have to work so hard that you sacrifice your family. And we talked about that a little bit. And then I I sensed that he was signaling that he and his wife were breaking up over this. And so I said something like, do you feel comfortable talking about whether you're married still? And he said, no, I don't feel comfortable. And there was a dis, uh, an uncomfortable moment there, but it was only a moment because then I shifted the conversation to something else and we were both laughing and you could see it. If you look frame by frame by frame, you could see the sequence of events happens like that because he told me he wasn't comfortable. I backed away and now he could feel comfortable enough to laugh and be himself because he knows that I'm not prying where he's not comfortable, that I am sensitive enough for his lines and that he is in control of where we stop the conversation. And mm-hmm. so what I'm saying is, if you don't feel comfortable asking a question about something personal or anything, you could use a double-barreled question, which is two questions in one. The first part is, do I have your permission to ask you? And the second part is what you want to ask about. And you can say, do you feel comfortable talking about your divorce? Is it inappropriate to ask you about why your company failed? ba 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 Two parts. That's the answer. I like it. Yeah. And asking for permission feels like a big part of that. If you feel like you're getting into some pretty vulnerable territory, you know, asking for their permission up front and also giving them that out, right? It's making it very easy for them to say, no, I'd rather not talk about that. And then you can move on. Um, By the way, is it inappropriate to ask you if you are all Christmas out all over your house or is it just this <laughs> one shot with like your Christmas sweater, right. the big tree, the for those, everything else? For those who are listening and not watching, I have we just set up our Christmas tree. It's actually a Hanukkah Christmas hybrid tree. So there's little okay. uh, dreidels all over it and we're going to be hanging gelt okay. on it. We got the Star of David on top. Okay. I'm Jewish. My wife was raised Catholic. So we kind of have, you know, our menorahs right here. And so we got we got everything lined up. And I mentioned to you before the podcast, we just hosted our winter soiree event today. So that's why I'm wearing the holiday sweater. This is probably, yeah, this is the most festive part of the house that you're seeing, so. Okay. <laughs> it, it is super festive. It's very festive. You know, I even have my, uh, our ranch um, ornaments. I don't know if you saw the Hidden Valley Ranch ornaments. On the oh. Because my wife and I are big fans. <laughs> I can't see because. Uh, the connection is a little blurry. Um, do you feel comfortable saying if you're going to raise your child with uh, Judaism or Catholicism or a combination of both? Sure. Yeah. See, I feel comfortable because you, you asked me for permission rather than just going <laughs> right at it. I was, I was obviously like overemphasizing course, the, the use yeah. of that technique, but but truthfully, I am, I'm, 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 I'm kind of, I'm really curious about that. And it's well, it's also not to deflect. I'm going to answer the question, but it's also funny that you bring this up and we do this because like. I've been on your podcast before and I've like listened to your podcast and so like you are very direct in a lot of your questions and, and you don't always ask for permission. Sometimes you just go right at it. Yes, but it's, it's like true. um you asking if I feel comfortable first does actually make me feel <laughs> so much less like defensive. <laughs> Cause there are definitely good questions you've asked before. I'm like, oh God, okay, let me figure out how to answer this. Uh child, yes, we are raising him Jewish. Uh, but wow. as you can see, we kind of celebrate multiple cultural aspects to both religions, but he will be 
raised Jewish, which is weird because my wife's not Jewish and technically by Jewish law, the mother is supposed to be Jewish, but we're kind of bypassing that. I find that the Judaism passes a lot of laws. Like we, we're not in a society where you have to live by every single one of the rules. So that makes sense. I'm, I'm just, uh, I think the more shocking part is that you're going for the thing that is less prevalent in the culture that you have to work much harder to, 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 uh, to teach. What do you mean? Well, if you said, I'm going to go for Catholicism, then ah. it's everywhere. Christianity is everywhere. If it's Judaism, you're basically like the kid from South Park. It's hard to be a Jew yeah. on Christmas. We're, then. we're all but, Kyle. I think he was okay. a Jewish one on South Park. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I grew up Jewish. I struggled a lot with it. And in a town that was had a ton of Jews in Long Island in New York, it's like half <laughs> Jewish. And I was still subjected to a lot of anti-Semitism. Mm. But Judaism's... Um, a big part of me and my life and my culture. My mom was born and raised in Israel. Her dad was pretty close to Orthodox, um, very religious. No, I had no idea. So it's like very um, part of like my family culture and history. And I do feel very connected it connected to it in my adult life. And my wife just didn't really feel that connected to her religion and actually feels very mm -hmm. connected to Judaism. She probably would have converted if it wasn't <laughs> so much goddamn work to convert to Judaism. <laughs> Um, so we, we were kind of always both on the same page that we'd want to raise Luca, our son, Jewish. But back I've to me doing the interview. Lot, but yes, go for it. <laughs> I knew this was going to happen. I feel like this probably happens to you a lot when you get on podcasts, you suddenly become the interviewer. Um, I wanted to ask about the book itself and the title, so stop asking questions. We've talked a lot about ask, asking questions and the way to phrase them, the way to structure them, and a way to get people to open up and be vulnerable. Um, why is the book titled Stop Asking Questions? I found that there was something going on in my interviews that made people feel like I was just too needy, too annoying. And there was a disrespect growing with my with my guests and I hated it. Mm. Um, in one of the live sessions that I did, this guy, the founder of Zero, was late to show up. And I felt so put down by that that I took it personally and I started like making fun of him. And I'm so embarrassed that I did that with an audience of people watching. And it turns out he was fully there, like ready to do the interview, just for some reason couldn't do it. And we know things pop up in life, right? I just told you that before I, I came to talk to you, I had an interview scheduled and I totally misread my calendar. And because of it, this guy was super busy because his company is growing fast, was just sitting there and I missed the interview with him. So what I'm saying is that I took a lot of that stuff personally when somebody disrespected me or saw me as too needy or insignificant. And I realized some of it was me just, you know, not, not feeling fully comfortable in my own skin in comparison to other people. But another part was the way that I was approaching conversations. Question after question after question starts to be so tiring that people start to see you as like this needy four-year-old. <laughs> when my kid was four years old, he was in the back of the car. Dad, why why is there a star on every one of these license plates in Texas? Why is it like it's like bah, 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 everything's a question? Why is it that people have the rammers in the front of the car? I don't know. It's very one sided. Why is it that the sorry? It's very one sided. It's like I'm taking. It's very one sided, and it's just too too much energy to have to constantly answer people's questions. And what I realized was, I was doing that for an hour with strangers, and it was exhausting. And I started changing my questioning from, from questions to statements, mm. just as an experiment, and it worked on its own. So instead of, how did you come up with the idea for your business? I might just say, tell me how you came up with the idea for your business. It's so subtle, but now there's a sense of leadership. Even though in that sense, what I'm doing is guiding, which is not that much different from asking a question, mm -hmm. it had an impact on the conversation. And so what I'm starting to say is that we think that conversations are great, that interviews are great when we ask a lot of questions. And the common, the common understanding is that. But when you want to get really good at something, you have to give up on the common sense, common approach. You have to look for something that is much better than that average. And so 
in this case, it means going against it. It means if you want to be an okay interviewer and you're going to do it occasionally, by all means, ask questions and nothing but questions. You'll come across as curious. You'll come across as interested. Phenomenal. But if you really want the person to respect you, if you're doing this over and over, if you want the person to see you as a leader and not just a kid with a notepad, the way to do it is to stop asking questions and occasionally switch up your questions into guided statements. Mm. Tell me where you got tell me how you got started. Tell me why you sold your business. Or as Kara Swisher, the tech reporter from the, uh, or journalist who's now uh, uh, with the New York Times, she says, um, talk a little bit about, and then she says what she wants you to talk about. If you listen to her uh, podcast episodes with the New York Times, it's talk a little bit about, yeah. talk a little about. Right. She's just, but it works, right? Totally. And so that's one approach. If rephrase it. Another one is share a little story of yourself, mm-hmm. right? A little vulnerability, a little bit of example of yourself. It takes the... I don't know, it takes the conversation from feeling like, oh, I've got to be on, I've got to help, I've got to do this, to the guest feeling like, ah, oh, this is a really interesting conversation where I'm being led by someone who's a real leader. Mm. I think it shows genuine interest and curiosity. It, 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 I think a lot of podcasts and interviewers and contents, I think a lot of these lessons apply across all content, not just uh, podcasts, but it shows a part like you're participating. You don't just have a list of questions that you're reading through. You're you're following through on the conversation. I think finding making it more conversational is also something that I always connect with. I try to do it a lot in this podcast, even even what I'm doing right now. It's a very meta interview we're having here. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, kind of responding with what I'm hearing you say and reflecting it back and sharing my own anecdote and then just Sometimes it's just stopping what I'm saying and leaving empty space for the other person to respond without me presenting it as a question, but just letting them build on the thing that I just said. Yeah. Like that. You know, (laughs) I find that uh, there was a period there when I was doing interviews where the world believed that everyone needs to know how to code, that everybody needs to know how to program a computer. And I started interviewing people like the founder of Bubble who said, I can... I can allow people to program without knowing how to code. We just created this visual thing. What I realized is that there are also people who I interviewed who have no interest in coding, phenomenally successful business, and at the same time, what they do well is is lead people, lead people through conversations. Mm -hmm. And I've just been amazed by that. I just happened to talk with an entrepreneur who did that today. His name is... um, uh, Laith Masarwe. And the guy stinks at programming computers. In fact, I actually think that his website is not, it's got little bits of, it's, he it clearly outsources to someone, but it has no heart. It's just nothing but like a brochure. Mm-hmm. But in a year, I think he's doing one and a half million dollars with his, now it's a virtual outsourcing company. Before that, he had a company that would do these virtual tours for real estate companies. And when I was talking to him, anything to do with programming, I could see because I'm looking at his eyes, anything to do with improving his software, he just could was bored. He couldn't care less. But when he's talking about how he had this conversation with this woman in the Philippines, he got excited. When he's talking about how there's this mentor that he never heard of before who's now sending him new customers and helping him grow his business, he got excited about that relationship. And I think that there's some people who are just really good at conversations, really good at leading, and the way that they do it is through conversations. And some of this stuff that I'm talking about comes naturally to them. The other parts, whether they do an interview or not, doesn't matter. They're just super curious about it. And to me, that's that's the that's the group of people I'm fascinated by. That's the group of people I wrote this book for. That's the group of people I'm turning my attention to right now. Mm. I, I love that example too. It reminds me of something that I've seen you tweet about uh, is motivated moments, something to look for when you're interviewing someone. Can you say a little bit about what motivated moments are? Yes. I'm not going to mention the person's name here. Yeah, I can't. Um, um, so this guy, I couldn't, we used to be great friends He seemed to have moved on beyond me, which happens, right? Stuff happens. Maybe he didn't like something I did. Maybe other things were more relevant. Lost touch. I'd reach out to him. Nothing. Reach out again. Hey, quick response. Nothing. Nothing. Suddenly the guy moves to Austin. I've been in Austin for a few months. He knows I'm in Austin. He's reaching out. Hey, Andrew, I heard you're in Austin. Guess what? I'm coming to Austin. Great. You're going to love it. Hey, Andrew, by the way, where are your kids going to school? Here's where they're going to school. Great. Hey, Andrew, we should get together for coffee. Good. Anytime. 
actually, Andrew, how about next Tuesday? Great, let's do next Tuesday. <laughs> we're sitting down there. How, um, how about coming over for, for dinner? Great, we're going to come over with the family. And the reason I say that is because not that it, he's, he's in a motivated moment. A motivated moment for him is he moved to a new city. He wants to get to know people. He wants his family to get to know other families. He's looking to integrate. Mm. When someone's moving to a new city, if you're there and you reach out to them and you say, I can introduce you around. I could show you a few places. I've got an Evernote or a Google Doc full of interesting things to do as a couple or as a new parent. Those are helpful. They're motivated to pay attention to you. They're motivated to give you their attention. That's uh, That's true in life. With interviewing... It's also true where someone like me has a book and I would ordinarily be swimming right now. There's a freaking spring water pool here. I'm going to go after this interview. But I would have swam twice as long if if uh, if I didn't have a book. But I got a book coming out or it's out already. And I'm motivated to promote it, to talk about it. And so I said yes to you, to doing, to doing this interview, even though this would be in my swim time. I said yes, David, to this girl who was in her college dorm who clearly had no audience but she had a curiosity about the book, and who knows? Maybe she'd get an audience based on this. So I said yes to her, and uh, and that's a motivated moment. And we have to look for those motivated moments and seize them. If you try to get somebody who's really hard to be a part of your community, a part of your world, a part of your podcast, and they're not in a motivated moment, it's really hard. If they are in a motivated moment, pow! Watch out, they're gonna be there. I love it. Yeah, definitely resonates. I've learned this. The, the hard way or just through experience uh getting people to speak at events it's the same kind of thing yeah. someone will say no to you a hundred times but when they launch a book or they have a new product coming out like if you can align with something that they're trying to achieve at that time all of a sudden it becomes a really good fit um and so the, for, i think for every industry there are places to go and find mm-hmm. those motivated moments right for uh, the book industry, Amazon and Barnes and Noble both have good lists of upcoming books, mm-hmm. right? You can see who's who's in your world, who's about to publish a book. They're going to be more likely to say yes to jumping into some kind of community chat, mm-hmm. to doing an interview, to even speaking at a live event. Tim Ferriss, famous four-hour workweek guy, right, is not looking to take on more stuff. He had a TV show that was coming out that he decided that he wasn't happy with the way it was going. He wanted to take it on himself and sell it directly. Mm-hmm. At that moment, I was doing a live event. He came to the live event. He talked at the live event. He actually let me interview him at the live event. He stayed with the audience, which is just because he's he's a mensch and he really cares about people. But if he was today, if I asked him, yeah. he wouldn't be as motivated. He's doing something else. He's disconnected. Motivated moments. You got to find those things. I love that. I love that practical tip of looking at upcoming authors on Amazon lists or, or Barnes & Noble lists. Uh, any other tips that you have for finding really great guests um, just in general, like who would make for a great guest, but also signals yep. for you know who might be motivated to come speak at your event or do an AMA in your community or be on a podcast? So I should say that for every industry, there are lists of people who are going to have a motivated moment, right? Upcoming books, list of people who are going to have a motivated moment. IMDb for movies, upcoming uh, uh, motivated moments. Product Hunt, or, or angel list to see who's getting funded or, or uh, crunch base to see who got funded, who's going to launch, right? And then is going to have a motivated moment. Those are key, people who get into accelerators in the tech space, so in every industry. If you want other tips for how to find someone, one of the best things that I learned was there's this book that people in the insurance industry love by a guy named Bill Cates, not Gates, but Cates. And he's all about teaching insurance salespeople how they can get referrals. And I said, I want to read this book. It was a fun little book, and I wanted to understand how they did it. And I learned something that I use for my interviews. What he says is after you do a service, after you sign someone up for insurance or sell anything, you say, so did you get value out of this? What is the value got out of this? And then, he's, and then the let, he lets the person talk. And then he says, well, do you know anyone else in your world, in your business, who could get that kind of value? And when they give you a name, Don't ask for the phone number or contact or would you make an introduction. Say, who else? And who else? And just keep writing down those names as they're talking about them. Then once they've exhausted their list, circle back and say, all right, how do I connect with these people? Would you make an introduction, right? And so you can hear me in the earlier interviews doing that within the interview. The interview is done. And then I say, 
who do you know? Well, first of all, I say, how'd this interview go for you? I mean, you didn't know what podcasting was, right? Now you did it. What do you think? And I say, oh, this is great. I actually like the way you're asking questions. The whole thing's set up so well. Maybe I'll do a podcast. Great. Go, who else do you know who should be doing an interview like this? And then they start to go into their list. And it is amazing. And what I would instinctively want to do is stop after the first one and say, okay, can you make an introduction? But instead I say, okay, who else? And you can see them give me a list. And it's incredibly helpful. So if you get someone to say yes to something and they've had a good experience, ask them what was good about it. You know, like give them a chance to tell you that they had a good experience. And then who else could use this kind of good experience is a good follow-up question. And only after you get a good list, do you come back and say, make an introduction, give me contact information, whatever you need next? I love that. We do that too with the with this podcast. We'll follow up and ask our guests, you know, is there another person that you think is a rising star or someone that you think would make for great guests? I ask questions at the end sometimes of like, who would you like to take out to lunch in the world of community? And so just kind of get who's inspiring to them. And then afterward, you know, follow up in an email and say like, hey, would you be able to introduce us to that person? Um, yeah. like to have that connection. And, and by the way, as a as an interviewer, as somebody who's got an audience, to ask without audience watching puts a lot of social pressure to have the person follow through, right? right? Totally. And so it's an unfair advantage. And it, once I got a really good list of guests, I stopped using that unfair advantage. Yeah. <laughs> but when you're getting started, you got to use what you can. And even if you don't do it on camera, do it afterwards and make sure that you say, was this good? Great. Now, who else could use this kind of good? Yep. I love it. All right, we're almost at time for our rapid fire question round at the end. Uh, but is there is there a question that I didn't ask you or a piece of advice that you think is really important for people to think about when doing great interviews or creating great content with somebody that we didn't cover? Yes. Uh, one thing that relates to anything that I do is there's got to be some kind of system where on your worst day, you still do it anyway. And so for me, I would have... I mean, we're talking about 14 years worth of interviews where I don't I don't miss weeks. I'm publishing consistently. And the way that I did it is by creating a system where there's always an interview on the calendar. Next week, there's going to be on, an interview on the calendar. I'm going to go away for the holidays. When I come back, there's going to be an interview on the calendar. You should have a process that automatically gets more people for you to follow up with, to interview, to work with. Otherwise, things just peter out. And if you don't have that, you're done. If you do have that on your worst day, you will show up. On my worst days when I've been exhausted, when I've had colds, I will show up to the office and now to the Airbnb in Austin or some random place in Austin because we're new here and I don't have an office yet. I will show up and I will do my interview because there are three people who are set up to do an interview and my team has pre-interviewed them and we've got them on the calendar and I just have to show up now and be there and I will show up and be there and suck up everything else. <laughs> That's really important and I think that we underestimate that because I think in this country we're very big on self-reliance, we're very big on self-improvement, self-discipline, self pa pa pa. I think that the day when you don't have the self-discipline, self-reliance, self-everything else, your system will carry you through and push you to still get it done. And that's tremendously effective and under underappreciated. I think what you're saying too is like cons having that consistent commitment. So if you're going to do the content, you're going to do the podcast saying like, we're going to do this every week. And the, the more you can schedule. I think we need more than that. Like the audience knowing it is really powerful, but seeing that there's a guest that you respect on the calendar, seeing that all you have to do is hit your link to start the conversation that is much more powerful. Yeah. If the audience expects it, that could end up being a real burden. If you miss a week, you start to think, oh, I missed a week. Now people know that I didn't follow through. And then you, you miss another week because you feel bad about it. Oh, now I'm such a loser. Why do I do this to myself? And before long, the whole thing peters out and you're ashamed. I've done that. I've been there. I think if you have a system, if you have a process that is bigger than you, it's way way, way, way more powerful. Just to simplify it is a system than just making sure that you always have at least a few interviews scheduled out in the context of a podcast so that there's always that upcoming yes. commitment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the biggest obligation you're going to have is to pick up the phone or to hit the link and have a conversation with the person. That's much bigger and it's much more real than, you know, an obligation to some nebulous people out there in the audience who may not even exist because yeah. you're starting out, right? 100%. Well, good news. I'm booked through February already, so I have my commitment uh, <laughs> all laid out. I actually have to do less interviews because it's getting tiring to do so many interviews. By the way, even the best, the, 
yeah, that can be a problem. But even the best salespeople, what now they do is they have SDRs who make sure that their calendar is always full so that they always have people that they're totally. going to talk to, exactly. sales development. Like we all should have that. Ideally, I, I think you and I are very fortunate to have teams around us that, you know, my team handles the scheduling and booking and, you know, we have this system set up for, for a lot of people it's who are true, doing it themselves. They just have go to, to Calendly, themselves. use the free system That's what on I do. Calendly yeah. to create a calendar link and then give it to people and make sure that it's on your calendar. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be hard to avoid it. If they've got the Calendly link, that's it. Exactly. That's exactly how we book uh, guests for this show. That's how you did it. You just book it right on Calendly. and. Mm -hmm then it's there. All right. By the way, it's getting darker and darker. So you see me keep moving my light <laughs> until it's going to be right in my face. By its, yeah. By the end, we just won't see your face at all because the light will be in front be of it. Nothing but a light. All righty. Well, we are almost at time here. So we're going to move into our rapid fire question round. Everyone's favorite part of the show where I ask questions, normal speed, and you answer them quickly. You ready? Yeah, I am. All right. First question, very important one. If you could only eat one food for the rest of your life, what would that food be? Pizza. Pizza. Good answer. Like a true New Yorker, you could survive yeah. on pizza. Just add whatever topping you need. Next question, what's your favorite book to give as a gift or to recommend to others? I don't have one, but I've discovered something. I'm sorry to go long on this one, but dude, this is amazing. <laughs> so my book just went on sale for 99 cents. It's going to be off sale by the time this interview is published. I'm not promoting that. But I realize... You can buy a dozen, two dozen, hundreds of copies of these books that are 99 cents on the Kindle whenever they go on sale for 99 cents. So obviously I bought a bunch of my books of, of, so that I can give it out throughout the year. But next time that someone like Ryan Holiday or Nir Eyal has a discount of 99 cents on their book, I will buy 10 or 20 for 99 cents each so that I can give it to somebody who will need that book at that time. And for like 30, 40 bucks, you have 40 books in Kindle ready to go. And it is an amazing thing to realize. And when they receive it, the price will go up from 99 cents to what, $15? So now I've given a $15 value book, mm -hmm. cost me only 99 cents. What a cheap mm. thing to say, but I'm telling you that <laughs> is so savvy. powerful. And you get a URL from Amazon, so you just give the link. <laughs> And it works. There you go. It's also making me realize I should probably do a 99 cent sale of my book sometime soon so that people yep. buy it as gifts. Uh, do, is there a book that like you find yourself going back to often or th that really had an impact on your life? The one that is really big for me was Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and right. Influence People. The second one that was good for me was... Um, a book that's just too boring to give out as a gift right now, but it's Andrew Carnegie's autobiography. I found that there was there was a lot of like American myths in there, but it was still helpful. Hmm. Like a, a cool. lot of what he's saying in there was just part of the story, us selling ourselves our own myth, but still useful. Interesting. I love autobiography, so I'm going to check that out. Uh, what's the most memorable founder you've ever interviewed? It's always the person that I interviewed most recently. Yeah. So Laith Masarwe is the founder who I just talked to about his virtual assistant company. And I just can't stop like thinking about him as an interesting person. And, um, uh, and that comes up. If I had to actually pick one over the years that, let me give you one that's a little more substantial um, because it stayed with me. Emmett Shear, he is someone who I was introduced to before Twitch sold, back when Twitch was just emerging. And his thought process, David, was amazing to think through how he took this general interest video site that was that seemed to be succeeding but was useless and reimagined it by talking to his audience and his creators and then creating Twitch into this thing that was a, a gaming streaming powerhouse is amazing. And the reason I was introduced to him is because I asked one of my other guests, who should I, who should I interview? And they introduced me to him and they said – that Emmett helped them think through customer development. And anyway, he's an amazing person. Great interview. Love it. Great thinker and underappreciated. I love it. Great example. All right, next question. Uh, what is the weirdest community you've ever been a part of? I, in this period when I was just kind of searching for stuff, I went to all these random things like, well, one of the communities was, this community called Ananda, where it was in person, 
And as I drove up, they said that there's no meat. And so I, I had the cab driver pull over and get me a bunch of burgers so that I could fill myself up. And then I drove up to this like seven, 10 day self-guided meditation on their community. And in their in the room that I rented from them, they there were all these mystical like they, there was Jesus, but then there were these other people who were close to anyway, the whole thing seemed so weird. But you know what? At the end, I loved it. I loved not their religion necessarily, even though I went to their to their prayer ceremony and all. I just love the simplicity of disconnecting. I love the simplicity of ha them having something as strange as come on up to our community and do nothing. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing. And I, I went in there thinking it was weird and I left there thinking I want to come back and I have. That's awesome. It's called Ananda. Ananda, yeah. It's in Northern California or like the border of California and Nevada. Pretty sure I've heard of it. Um, that sounds awesome. It was kind of built on Yogananda, which a lot of people have read the autobiography of a yogi. There was mm. some kind of connection there. And then there's some kind of split between two different groups of people. I didn't get too deep into mm. their politics, yeah. <laughs> but it's it has an interesting foundation. Cool. Love it. Next question. What's your favorite conversation starter or interview question that you like to use? <laughs> Um, I really look for the personal questions. There was a big period in my life where I would ask people, so when did you lose your virginity? That was pretty <laughs> Very um, personal. That was very personal. Um, I would ask it in a personal way that worked. Did you ask you for know, permission Now you know my techniques. <laughs> I do, yeah. Actually, there yes, yes. All right. <laughs> but that was, a, that was a big one. Do you have another one? I have to get another one. And, uh, I do in my interviews ask people what their revenue is at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, when I had a kid, I would ask the fathers, "Are you still sleeping with your wife?" Like I would get into <laughs> still sleeping in the same room. Oh, was, like yeah, are you still you sleeping with your wife? <laughs> are you having sex? Like what? Like you know, I I found that a lot of them were pretty stiff San Franciscan people, and I wanted to understand more about what was what's up for my life and what's going on in theirs and. Yeah, I, basically what I'm trying to do is say, what am I genuinely curious about? And let's go into that. And also what's so personal that if we have that conversation, we're gonna be closer. We're gonna be like 20 dates in at the end of that conversation, you know? Mm. 20 years into, uh, 20 years is too much. But I wanna go deeper in the relationship and sometimes asking questions that you would only say to a personal friend that you've known for a long time um, makes that happen quicker. All right, well, my next question is a very, very personal one. Have you ever worn socks with sandals? <laughs> but I I did in the house once. There was a period where Crocs were kind of in, and so Crocs in are the in house, now. I, don't I know kept if you my socks this. on. They're very in now. I did not. Yeah, they, they are? are? They're very in. Try them with socks. They're so freaking comfortable worn, that it sucks. I've never worn them. I'm more of a Birkin Crocs socks Crocs with guy. socks. Bir oh. Birks and socks. Mm. All right, Crocs and socks. Is good. All right, that counts. Those are like Crocs sandals. and socks, try it. Um, who in the world? But I never left the house with that. Well, the, the, so this is a question I, I teased up before. Uh, who in the world of community would you most like to take out for lunch or interview on your podcast in your context? Um, right now, there's someone who I think is really interesting, Nick O'Neill. Hmm. He got excited about NFTs really early on, and he created a site called The Nifty and a podcast that went along with that. I've known Nick for years. Um, and what's interesting about him is that I find that a lot of the crypto and NFT stuff is, is in these hidden discords, mm -hmm. in these hidden communities. And I kind of need somebody who knows all that to to spend time with to help me understand how that works, where where some of the good Discord uh, groups are, um, I guess you call servers, and then also to just see how he's doing his, how he's building his, and staying on top of it all. Mm -hmm. I love it. All right. Well, look for the email after this interview where I ask you for the introduction. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I think um, I think he's he's killer good. He's yeah. the guy who also created all Facebook in the early days of Facebook, oh, documented cool. and blogged about them, and then he was he was he was big on them early on. That's dope. Mm -hmm. And we we've been having a lot of Web three themed interviews on the show recently, so definitely gonna keep that. So you going. get to focus on what you're interested in. Exactly, exactly. Perfect example for me is I've been interested in Web three, so a lot of the <laughs> interviews that are mm -hmm. coming up are all Web three focused. 
Um, all right, last question for you. If you were to find yourself on your deathbed today and you had to condense all of your life lessons into one piece of advice for the rest of the world, what would that advice be? <laughs> uh, suffer for what matters. Why is that your answer? I think uh, if I look at the things that were most meaningful to me, I had to really work on them. And at the time, I didn't think that they ma that not that they mattered, but that the suffering was maybe wrong. And I think that maybe when I say the word suffer, people have a different view of it. But I'm a guy who for a long time loved indoor cycling, you know, on, on trainers. And I would go and watch these people with their with their pain caves and their apps called suffer fast, you know, mm. that they're willing to work to the point of pain because that's when the real juice comes out. When you get past that for something meaningful, like better health, or maybe it's just to win a competition on this virtual world that's attached to your indoor bike, it's worth it. And when I think about how much work I went to, to get to the point where I could date, get to the point where I could find the right woman, get to the point where I could like be in love fully, that, that was definite suffering. Mm -hmm. And I, I would talk to someone on a regular basis about how I was doing and it was worth it, right? I'm with someone that I respect and that it was worth the work to get to. Mm -hmm. I think when, uh, when my brother and I started our first company, that greeting card company, I was in such pain at night working endless hours, feeling like such a failure for spending hours and earning the equivalent of less than minimum wage. And I felt like that's a lot of pain. But when I look back, it was worth it. And I think that we are in an environment right now where we're just like enjoy life a lot. And I'm in a place in my life where I, I like to enjoy life a lot. But the best things to come were, were after all that suffering, all that pain. And so that's why I would leave that as, as advice. I love that. Uh, very much resonates both in being an entrepreneur. Similarly, my relationship, I think I suffered more from the first couple of years of my relationship than in anything else. And, you know, now we've been together for over 13 years, very happily. Um, mm -hmm. But it wasn't easy at first. It was the hardest I ever had to work on anything. Um, Wow. Yeah. You know what? Now I want to dive into that, but I know we're at the end, so I'm not going to. But that's like a bunch of shoved facts shoved that are facts, just yelling exactly. for conversation. Yeah. Well, we have uh, to save well, something for the next uh, for the next interview that you and I will have, I'm sure. Screw that. Next time we have scotch, I'd love to have scotch with you. I'd love to get together with you in person again. I wish. What city are you in? You're still in San Francisco? Yeah. The last person here, actually. Oh. <laughs> I know we just left a few months ago and it's kind of cool that a lot of people are here, but I'd love to get together with you. I wish you were here. In Austin. That's where you are now, right? In Austin yeah. right now. I love Austin. Yeah. I'll be there soon. You'll be here again. I'll be in New York a lot yeah. too. I'm sure we'll both be back there. Yep. So scotch date coming up. All right. And lastly, Andrew, where can people go to continue to learn from you and follow you and go buy the book? I'm totally Googleable. If you search for Andrew Warner, all the other Andrew Warners are upset with me because I show up at the top. <laughs> um, if you want to buy the book, it's on Amazon and every other online bookseller. And finally, um, the podcast. If you want to see how I do this stuff, how I use these techniques that I talk about, look for Andrew Warner in your podcast app or the podcast is called Mixergy, M-I-X-E-R-G-Y. David, thanks. Of course, I highly recommend the podcast as you've heard throughout this interview. Go check it out. Andrew, I really appreciate you coming on the show um, and just want to express my gratitude for, for everything that you've done. Like I said, you were one of the first people that I followed in the world of entrepreneurship. Mixergy was like my school when I first started out and um, was, was hugely beneficial to me. And when people ask me how I learn to interview and run my podcast, you are one of the people I always mention as like, part of my style was inspired by hearing you do a lot of interviews and the way you, you know, get really practical and go deeper and don't let people, you know, skip over questions too easily. Um, I always just really admire your curiosity and, um, and, and how generous you are with trying to help other people learn things as well. So it truly is, it's, it's kind of surreal and a little bit of a dream come true to have you come on my podcast so many years later. And I really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks. Yeah, I've enjoyed getting to know you over the years, and I'm glad that we 
become closer and I hope we'll become even more so as we continue. Thanks, man. And thanks for the support with the book. Of course. Go buy the book. Stop asking questions. Become a better interviewer. Appreciate you all listening and uh, we'll see you next time.